Christmas or the Advent season reminds us of hope, the hope that we have and the hope that we need. Because if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes that, that hope is hard to find. Sometimes it seems distant. Sometimes it's, it's kind of like an echo, right? You, you've, you've experienced an echo before, haven't you, where you yell into a loud canyon or across the water and, you know, your voice goes out and it gets distant. And then you can kind of just hear it reverberating out in the space. Sometimes that is what hope feels like. Sometimes it feels like it's way off. It's distant somewhere. For me, this Christmas uh, marks 10 years since my dad passed away. And it's, it's in these times where I struggle. It's been 10 years since... We've been able to go hunting together. It's been 10 years since we were able to talk on the phone with one another. It's, it's been 10 years since we were able to embrace. And every Thanksgiving, every Christmas serves as a reminder of that difficult time, of that time of loss, that hopelessness. It's, it's like an echo that just keeps coming back year after year. I'm, I'm sure some of us can relate with that this morning as maybe there was a place that was at our Thanksgiving table that was empty. Or maybe this Christmas when we celebrate, there'll be a place that is empty. And it's something we're struggling with. For us, this season isn't as joyous as it once was because of maybe a loss we've experienced, something that's happened in the past, or maybe it's something we're experiencing right now, a difficult diagnosis, the loss of a job, separation or, or distance from a loved one. Maybe our, our marriage is struggling. Or perhaps we know of someone else and their dear friends and their marriage is struggling and we're not sure what to do about it. Or like Matt shared just the other week, you know, we've, we've got this hope for a child, but that's just not a reality for us right now. And, and my friends, if, if we're honest, sometimes it's in those situations where we feel alone, but I need us to remember that we are not. We are not alone. Times of hopelessness and struggle have been a reality across the ages. People have always been searching for hope. This is a theme that is seen throughout history. In fact, if we go back to the Genesis account, all the way back to the first book in the Bible about chapter 11, in verse 27, we read a historical account about the beginning of the, the Jewish people. Very early on in history, we see a, a father whose name is Terah, and he's got three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and, and they're living in a wealthy Mesopotamian city known as Ur. It's located on the Euphrates River, river in, in modern-day Iraq, and, and one of Terah's sons, Haran, dies. He experiences lost. He experiences hopelessness. And that's most likely due to the fact that there was a famine in the land. They're wondering where their next meal is going to come from, how, they're gonna, how he's going to provide for his kids, how he's, how he's going to have enough for them to make ends meet this situation of hopelessness and a grief and experiencing death. And then if that's not enough, the Elamites come and they destroy, they invade Ur. It's wiped off the map. So now there's this great migration to the West. There's this displacement of this people group. And, and Terah and his son Abram, they're a part of this group, and they're moving, and they're traveling, and they're leaving everything they other known. And they settle in this place called Haran. And eventually... Terah dies, leaving only Abram. So now he's experienced the death of his brother. He's experienced the death of his father. And, and he's had to leave his homeland. He's, he's going through famine. And, and he's got his nephew with him. And, and, and now they've, everything has changed. They've had to leave their comfortable city of Ur. Things are hard. They're, they're difficult. Their lives are now marked by death and famine and destruction and displacement. And on, on top of that, Abram and his wife Sarah... They, they want a baby, they want some hope in their life, and yet they're unable to have one. Within chapter 11, verse 30, we read that Sabrin and 
or Abram and Sarah, they're unable to have children. They can't conceive. Is this it? Is this the reality? Is this what they're resigned to? And yet in the midst of this darkness, in the midst of this tragedy, we find the voice of God entering in. A voice entering in with a promise, a promise to be echoed throughout eternity, as he says in chapter 12, verse 1. Go. Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to a land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And believe it or not, my friends, but it is in this declaration in Genesis chapter 12. I mean, Genesis, who would have thought? It is in Genesis chapter 12 that we see an echo of Christmas. An echo that is reverberated throughout time that brings us hope, even in the most difficult of circumstances, because that's one of the things that these Christmas echoes or foretellings in the Old Testament do. They remind us of hope. And yet it was we, as we look at this passage, as we look at what we've just read in, in the life of Abram and Sarah and, and all that they've been through and the hardship and the difficulty, the question remains, where is the hope? Where, where do we see the promise of God fulfilled? He says, I'm going to make you, a, a, I'm going to bless you and, and you're going to be a blessing to others. And, and there's all, all these wonderful things that are going to be happening to you. At this time, Abram is 75 years old. He's 75 years old, and there's a disconnect between what God is saying to him and the reality that he's experiencing. In fact, if you look at the scriptures, you understand that it was 25 years before Abram and Sarah actually had this child, before this promise would be fulfilled. There was a disconnect between this God that they knew and what he was saying to them and the reality that they were experiencing. And you can't tell me that's not hard. You can't tell me that that's not difficult, that discouragement doesn't take place in those kinds of situations, in that kind of season. That could be some of us right now. Where we're looking at the scripture and we're saying, I know God says this about my life and I know God wants this for me, but yet... These are my circumstances. This is where I'm at, and I'm struggling. Certainly, Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth understood this. If we look at the New Testament, specifically in Luke 1, we find the same kind of scenario happening at the beginning of the Christmas story. Just like Abram and, and Sarah weren't able to conceive in their old age, so are Zechariah and, and Elizabeth. They're both well advanced in years. And Zechariah has been serving at the temple, and they, and they can't have a child. And in those days, children were seen as, as an affirmation of God's blessing on your life. If you didn't have children, it was like, what'd you do wrong? You messed up. God's blessing is in your life. And they live with this until they're very, very old. There's a disconnect between what Zechariah is, is, is reading and understanding and learning about God. He's serving in the temple. He knows this blessing that he's supposed to be experiencing. Yet where is it? And then one day he goes into the temple and an angel appears to him. The angel Gabriel. And he says, Zechariah. Your wife is going to have a baby. And he's going to be the forerunner to the Messiah, the promised descendant of David who would restore and rescue God's people who'd been living in exile for 400 years in a, in a land not their own. And sure enough, after that announcement, not too long, Elizabeth has a child. She calls him John. And this child grows up to bring hope back to the people of God. Shortly after, Luke 2, we read of, 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 of another angel. Actually, the same angel, the angel Gabriel. God sends to Nazareth, to a town in, in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary, who's pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. And when the angel shows up, he's got a message for Mary. Mary's at the beginning stages now of having children. And the angel says to her, Mary, you're going to have a 
baby. The problem being she doesn't have a husband. I mean, how does that happen? I mean, she, she hasn't been with somebody. You don't know there's a process for which babies are made. Mary, the scripture tells us, hadn't been through that process. You're going to have a baby, and she's, she's afraid. How is that going to happen? That's, that's impossible. And the angel says, the Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you. Make possible the impossible. Just like he made possible with Abram. Just like he made possible with Elizabeth and, and Zechariah. And, and this son she would have would inherit the throne of David and he would be the promised ruler whose kingdom would never end. And if you read on, you know what happens. She has a baby. And her fiancé name him, her and her fiancé name him Jesus. Echoes, my friends. Echoes that we see people in difficult situations. Some of them displaced. Others oppressed. People in hard circumstances. And yet in them, God speaks hope. He speaks hope. Abram could find hope and that a child would be born to him. Even in the midst of all his, his hardship and suffering and displacement and loss. Losing his brother. Losing his father. Not being able to have children. When his whole life previous, he was in, in distress, he was going to experience hope. My friends, what this speaks to us is that no matter our circumstances, no matter the space or the disconnect that we may be living in, that waiting, we not only see it in the Christmas story, but echoed throughout history all the way back to Abram, the reminder that God can do the impossible in our lives. God can do the impossible in our lives. That's what this season is all about. That's why we light these candles. Because God can do the impossible. Remembering that when there was no foreseeable way forward for God's people, for humanity as a whole, when there was stress, sin and destruction, God made a way forward. It's what He does. He made a way forward in the manger. He enters into our mess, into our chaos, into our brokenness and pain and makes the impossible possible. And some of us need to be reminded of that today. Some of us need to be reminded because the situations we're going through right now, they make us doubt. They make us fear. They make us question God's blessing. Is it really true? Because it seems kind of distant. It's not what I'm experiencing in my life. It's certainly not what I see others experiencing in theirs. We feel like giving up. God says, hang on a minute. God says, wait. He says, don't, don't quit just yet. Don't give up yet because I have something for you. And it's more than what you've been expecting. Just like we see here, uh, God had more for Abram than just a child. Right? It wasn't just one child. It was, it was many children. Many. In fact, as we read in the text, God had children planned for him and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, a nation was going to come from his family line. And as we read the promise, it says, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. So we get the sense that from this family line are going to come those with authority. Abram's going to have authority, and his children are going to have authority, and his great children are going to have authority. Kings are going to come from his family line. Rulers. In fact, in Genesis 49.10, we read of Abram's, or, or now Abraham's grandson, Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abram, uh, blessing his children before he passes on. In ancient times, this was a practice that, that fathers would do before their passing. Fathers would speak prophetic words over their sons. Interestingly enough, when my dad was passing away, he, he prayed for me and he spoke 
words into my life and ask that God would help those to come true. Sometimes in in the scriptures, these words are good. Sometimes they're not so good. But in Genesis 49.10, this is what we read of Abram's great-grandson, Judah. This is... This is what Judah's father, Jacob, Abram's great-grandson, speaks over him. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. He's speaking a message of authority. Judah, you're going to have authority. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness who dares to rouse him. You're going to rule, Judah. The scepter will not depart from you, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations be his. Scholars view this passage as a messianic prophecy, an echo foretelling Jesus' birth and reign. The prophet Ezekiel speaks the same kind of language towards the king of Judah at the time when he says in Ezekiel 21, 21, sharing with the ruler of Judah, a ruin, a ruin, I will make it a ruin. You're going to go into exile. Your authority's going to be removed. The crown will not be restored until he to whom it rightfully belongs shall come, and to him I will give it. It's the same kind of language. There is a that the Bible tells us who rightly and worthily deserves to rule and wear the crown of authority. If you recall in Israel's history, there would be good kings and bad kings. You can read them about them in a book called Kings, right? There's two books, First and Second Kings, and and another uh, another couple of books containing the affirmation of First and Second Kings. Chronicles, and there's going to be good kings, and there's going to be bad kings, but one of their kings, David, who you may be familiar with, David who defeated Goliath with the sling, right? You know, when he falls over, right? David, Israel's greatest king, would come from the tribe of Judah, Judah, and he would have a descendant named Joseph, who would be the earthly father figure for Jesus, who would not demonstrate his authority with a crown, but with his words and actions and affirmation of his heavenly father. You see, we can have hope this Advent season. We can find hope in the echoes of Christmas throughout history, even in Abram's calling, because as spoken over him, there is a king whom everything and everyone is subject. There is a king. In Matthew 2, the Bible tells us that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Magi uh, were typically leading figures in their courts, in their communities, uh, dealing with their countrymen. They had been given certain amounts of authority due to their uh, scholarliness or scientific or diplomatic or religious works. And the scriptures say that these magi uh, came from the east. That lets us know that they weren't Jewish authorities. They weren't Jewish figures. They were, they were of the world's authorities. And yet these men would come, as Matthew Wilkins would say, because Matthew wants his readers to know that Jesus is king. Everybody is going to bow down to him. He is the ruler. And this Christmas holiday, this season, we've just come through a political year. So the imagery or the narrative fits very well. Elections have recently taken place, and you're like, oh, no, where is he going with this? Hang on, we'll get there. It'll be good, I promise, okay? Elections have recently taken place in our community, in our state, and in our country. Uh, People have been granted authority, right? I I think there's like a runoff in Georgia or something that's going to be happening, and people are like, oh. What's going to happen? But you know, no matter which way we may lean, whether, whether we're happy w- with the outcome, whether we're discouraged, whether we feel like our country is headed in a good way or we feel like it's headed in a, a negative way, or we're looking at the world around us going, there's all this chaos and, and stuff going wrong, and we're tempted to think, all is lost. All is lost. What are we going to do? Run for the hills. I don't know how we're going to recover. I want to remind us, Jesus is still king. 
Jesus is still king. The political authorities of the world and the scholars and the religious leaders from his birth, they bowed down to him. They worshiped him, reminding us our hope. My friends, our hope, we don't need to get worked up about this stuff. Our hope is not in political authorities or parties or presidents or kings or queens or prime ministers or governors. The kingdom of God does not rise and fall on these ideologies and these positions. Yes, we need to be involved in politics. Yes, we, we need to uh, uh, be informed or let the scriptures inform how we vote and who we elect and the policies and those kinds of things. But remember, God and God alone is sovereign and he will accomplish his plan and purpose. And he's going to do that through us. And if we don't join him, he's going to do it in spite of us. If you remember, Herod was king of Israel at the time of Jesus' birth, and he gave the order to kill all children two years old and younger because he heard that there was this king who was going to be born. So he said, we're going to take care of that so all these babies are killed. Did that stop God's plan? Did that keep it from happening? No. Because you see, my friends, no matter how bad things seem, God is still at work. God is still in control. Go back back with me quickly to the last part of verse 3. Because not only does God promise a a child, not only does he he promise a nation and an authority, but he also promises all peoples on earth will be blessed through Abram. They'll they'll all be blessed. And this is what we want to get. Abram or or later, Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. Yet if we read the the very next passage of Scripture, in verse 10 of chapter 12, we read that due to a famine in the land, right? we're going through this hardship, going through this difficulty, God says, get up and move, and I'm going to bless you. Due to the famine in the land, he goes down to Egypt. He's trying to find food. And like a wise husband, attention men, like a wise husband, he says to his wife, I know you are very beautiful. Right? Husbands, this is your cue. You need to make sure your wife knows she's beautiful. When she dresses well, you compliment her. Even she doesn't dress well. You compliment her, right? Your wife needs to know she's beautiful. But then he says, I need you to tell the people that you're not my wife. I need you to tell them that you're my sister. Because when they see how beautiful you are, they're going to want to take you from me. My life could be in danger. And so you tell them you're my sister because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what they'll do to me. And so they go in, and, and this is what they do. Hey, who's that beautiful lady? That's my sister. <laughs> really? Yeah. And, and then she's called into Pharaoh's household, into his court, and Abram's given gifts, and he's blessed because of it. But, you know, Pharaoh's like, wow, this lady's really cute. And so he's kind of you know, sparking on her a little bit. And God says, that's not my plan. That's not my promise. My promise is to Abram, not to Pharaoh. So he causes this disease to come on Pharaoh's household because he's going to protect his promise. And Pharaoh kind of figures out what's going on and he says, Abram, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't, why didn't you tell me? Get up. Get, get, get your wife. Get out of here. Go on. Leave. And in this way, Abram became a curse rather than a blessing. You follow me? Abram was blessed to be a blessing, and yet in a short amount of time, he failed to live out that calling. Now listen to me, friends, because where Abram or Abraham failed at blessing all people, one of his descendants would not. Where Abram gave in to fear in order to save his own life, his descendant, 
this baby in the manger of the tribe of Judah, whose birth we're getting ready to celebrate, who's the reason we light this candle, this king of kings would not give in to fear. Rather, when he grew up, he would walk a road with a large wooden beam on his back, and he would be hung on a cross. He wouldn't give in to fear. No, he would lay down his life instead of trying to preserve it. And in this way, he would become the vehicle through which all people could find hope, the hope they're so desperately searching for. Friends, if you, if you look around us today, if you turn on the news, if you read the paper, right, if you're listening to your favorite podcast, you'll understand that people are in desperate need of hope. I got a phone call th this week from a family. Remember the cold weather we experienced at the beginning of the week? I do. I had ice on the front of my car. There was a family living in a storage unit. They called and said, we're freezing. We need help. I, uh, I talked to somebody else. Their, their, their son is in jail. Drugs have destroyed his life. And I stopped and I asked, why? why? Why would somebody turn to drugs and alcohol knowing the consequences that they bring? And I, I strongly believe it's because most people have this, this giant hole in their heart, this giant feeling of hopelessness. And they're trying to fill it up. They're, they're trying to cope with all that's happening in their lives because they feel hopeless. So often, so often when we have this feeling, so often when this is our reality, we resign to filling ourselves up with, with stuff, with activities, with busyness, with work, with relationships, with, with money, with whatever we can find because we're so afraid of not having enough. We're so afraid of, of being hopeless. And yet like Abram, like Abraham, as, as hard as we try and as good as intentions we have, we fail. We, fail. we know the promise. We know the blessing. But we fail. My friends, let me share with you this morning, the devil doesn't want us to know. Let me share with you this morning something that the spiritual forces of darkness do, want, do not want us to know. Jesus doesn't fail. Jesus does not fail. In fact, turn to your neighbor right now and tell them, Jesus doesn't fail he doesn't and we need to kick this advent season off we need to remind ourselves of this echo across time in history that jesus doesn't fail advent is not a time for fear but advent is a time for hope it's a time for faith it's a time for trust i was telling you about my dad at the beginning i i i still remember being in the hospital and walking down to that area, to that floor where all the rooms were that people in desperate need of hope were lying in. I'd been traveling all day. I was starving. I needed something to eat. So we went to the dining room, got something to eat, and we're on our way back to his room when on the speakers we hear code blue, code blue, code blue. And I remember thinking, this can't be reality. This is not happening. And I, I walk into the room, and my mom is throwing herself on my dad. She's smothering him with hugs and with tears and with kisses, trying so desperately to hang on to him. And we're grieving, and it's hard, and it's difficult. And in the midst of all that's going on, suddenly the strangest thing begins to happen. We start to circle up. We begin to sing. Constantly abiding. Jesus is mine. Constantly abiding. Rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, but whispers, oh, 
so kind. I will never leave thee. Jesus is mine. Jesus doesn't fail. Jesus didn't abandon Abram. Jesus didn't abandon Zechariah and Elizabeth. Jesus didn't abandon his people who were living in exile, who were displaced. Jesus didn't abandon Mary and Joseph when Herod issued the order to kill the babies. Jesus won't abandon you. Jesus won't abandon us. He is our hope. He was Abraham's hope. He was an echo. He's our echo today. He's our hope. And in a world that desperately needs hope today, the question is, how do we join in? How do we join in with this hope? And it could be that that we need God to do something impossible in our lives. It could be right now that we're experiencing that disconnect, that we know God says this, but that's not our present reality. That's not what we're experiencing. And, and we're feeling hopeless. Maybe, maybe someone's got a difficult diagnosis. Maybe our marriage is on the rocks. Maybe school's kicking our butts and we just can't seem to get it right. Whatever the situation is, here's what I want us to know. God cares. God cares and He's the solution. And if we ever... If we ever want to be the kind of hope for someone else that we're so desperately seeking, we need to be filled with it ourselves. Friends, do you need God to do something big in your life this morning? Do you need God to do something big in the life of one of your family members? Do you need Him to show up in the disconnect that you're experiencing right now. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't, don't take time to say, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Be like Abram. Be obedient. Get up and go. Go to Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. God, I need you. I need you in my life. I need you to show up in this big way. I'm struggling with this sin. I'm struggling with this situation. I can't seem to get it right. My my job is chaos right now. My family's chaos right now. God, I need you in this season to show up in a big way. Are you there? You don't need to say what it is. But this morning, there's a disconnect. And you need Jesus. I want to invite you to be like Abram. And to get up and to go. To, to seek the presence of God. We're going to designate this space up front here in altar this morning. And if you need a touch from God in your life, if you need him to show up in a big way, I'm just going to invite you to come and stand in this space. We're not going to wait long. If you want to come and be with somebody, come and support somebody, you do that. Don't let this moment pass. Maybe you're sitting in your chair. (laughs) Maybe you're online watching this morning. Pause. Sit down. Ask God to do the impossible. First service, somebody just got diagnosed with a brain tumor this week. Going through a hard time. Somebody else was diagnosed with cirrhosis of the liver. Somebody else, they've, they've, got, they've got a son who's estranged, who doesn't know Jesus, and they're desperately praying for him. 
And I know some of us here this morning are struggling with the same things. Saying, God, I need you to show up in a big way.